Good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, Greenhorn session three, uh, retinal detachment with PVR. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, the vice counsel for the day, Dr. Sarvanan. Dr. Sarvanan. Uh. Uh, Dr. Mahesh Anmugam. Dr. Pramod Vende is already here. Dr. Ramdeep Singh is here. Dr. Lingam Gopal, sir. And Dr. Rajpal Bora, sir. Please come, sir. All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite the first speaker of the day to deliver the keynote lecture for this session, uh, an old friend of VRSI and uh, an ally of VRSI who supported us uh, for several years and the past recipient of the Nataraj Pillai Award, uh, Dr. Michael W. Stewart from Mayo Clinic, US, who's going to talk to us on vitrectomy or plus uh, SB or square buckling or only vitrectomy. I think this is an age old raging debate, and I'm sure Dr. Michael Stewart will give us some valuable insights. Thank you. Dr. Rajendram, thank you very much. And, and I want to applaud everyone here for being here on the final morning of this meeting, showing your devotion uh, to all of our professional developments. So though this session is on Greenhorn and PVR, the title of this talk suggested that there's a little bit of laterality in terms of the use of a buckle with or without vitrectomy, both in those cases without and with PVR. But I've actually included both in this talk. Um, and so we will talk about first, do eyes without PVR need a buckle if you're doing a vitrectomy? And then secondly, do eyes with PVR need a buckle? And I think that's going to cover just about all of what was in, included in my title. So let's first of all talk about retinal detachments in eyes without PVR. And most people, I believe, would use a vitrectomy as their tool of choice. So there are lots of studies, both retrospective and prospective, randomized and non-randomized, that have shown no consistent differences in attachment rates with vitrectomy with or without a scleral buckle. And you can see some of the quotations from the authors of these studies. The vitrectomy is, is effective, but the benefit of a buckle is questionable. They seem to have equal efficacy and that an encircling band is not significantly reduce the risk of failure of the detachment. But there are also some studies, a smaller number, that suggest that the addition of a buckle to a vitrectomy in an eye without PBR improves the single surgery success rates. Um, and you can see in the middle of the study there by Joseph et al., uh, with the buckle, they had a success rate of 92% compared to 84% with vitrectomy alone. Um, I want to throw out a caveat, and it was not included in the title of this session, but for most primary regmatogenous retinal detachments, my first choice is a buckle until proven otherwise. There are obviously circumstances that rule against that for which vitrectomy has an unquestionable advantage, but I'm of the school and I've got enough experience over the years that I like to do a buckle first. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, some of which I'll talk about in this. Um, there are lots of nuances here. Not all detachments are created equally. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is never underestimate the value of a top quality exam. Do the best you can in the clinic, identify all breaks, identify any evidence of PBR, and then do the same in the operating room. Whether you do that under the microscope of spoiled depression or whether you do that with an indirect ophthalmoscopy in advance, never underestimate the value of finding all breaks, and, and identifying all traction. One of the things to keep in mind, this goes back to my statement about a soil buckle. When a primary detachment surgery fails, PVR is usually or most commonly the cause, but PVR tends to be worse in eyes that have had vitrectomy versus those that have an intact vitreous and have had a buckle only. So one of those things to keep in mind from what people see in the literature. My feeling, especially as I get a little older and look at detachments, I hate pre-ops. I hate having to do reoperative surgery on retinal detachments. And so do everything you can and need to to fix it right the first time. 
keep that mindset whenever you're in the operating room. Always be sure of the, pro of the following when you're dealing with these eyes. Performal skill depression, under the microscope, preoperatively, and assess how good are your skills? How good are you at identifying all breaks? Uh, my favorite procedure is a, buck is a buckle without drainage. However, a buckle without drainage requires, it's absolutely required you identify all breaks. Because if you miss one in a detached retina, net, your surgery fails from the moment you've done the surgery. Not the case necessarily with the vitrectomy or vitrectomy buckle. So be critical of your own evaluation skills. Most common cause of failure is PVR. But in my hands, or at least in my experience, when I see patients either referred to me for failed detachment or patients seeking second opinion because a detachment surgery has failed, I find that incomplete vitrectomy is the number one reason for failed surgery. And incomplete vitrectomy means you have not release fraction from all the breaks. So, what, so after doing a good exam, if you're doing a vitrectomy, be very careful, you release all traction, pay attention to the breaks, make sure you've got it there. And if you're doing a vitrectomy without a buckle, you've got to laser all the breaks. If you do a buckle, there is evidence now mounting and that if the buckle is placed properly, a retinopexy is not critical. But in the absence of a retinopexy, or the absence of a buckle, be sure to do a retinopexy. But there are eyes without PVR that we don't need a buckle, without a question. For example, uh, giant retinal tears. Uh, I, you know, back in my younger days when I didn't know better, I would put some buckles on these, and of course, you know, they're not necessary. Uh, the only exception I would make is if you're worried about traction at the edge of the tears, or you're worried about repeat traction in areas where there is no tear. Uh, I would argue that the presence of a buckle actually might predispose you to a greater risk of detachment in the area of the pre-existing tear, because you've increased the curvature of the eye and you've increased the inward forces against the retina rather than the outward forces. So something to keep in mind, but for most giant tears, no need to put a buckle on. Uh, what are the nuances that would push you towards a buckle and away from vitrectomy alone? Well, if you can't visualize the retina completely, you've got opacities of some reason, then a buckle gives you perhaps an added sense of security. You're, in a, you're unable to remove all vitreous traction. You should be able to, but the reality is when getting to surgery, you don't always, aren't always able. You've got lots of retinal breaks. If I'm seeing breaks in three quadrants, um, then I'm worried about ongoing traction, and I often have to question, what's my ability to get rid of the traction in areas where there are no breaks, and will they occur? I like to have a buckle in those circumstances. If the patient's not able to, to position properly, if you've got predominantly inferior tears, where positioning is critical, or if your patient has to fly or travel to altitude very soon, and you're forced to use air rather than a longer acting gas, then a buckle would be a valuable addition to your surgery. So, should one do a buckle in general? Well, let me paraphrase Steve Charles. When faced with a detachment, he imagines what he would have to do if he needed to do a re-op, and then he does that first. So here's a mindset that says, doing more initially gives you an added sense of security. But then I'll also go down to my statement on the lower right. Remember, the more steps you do, the greater the likelihood of causing problems. And so simple surgeries generally are better as long as you've taken care of the entire pathology. Let's go now to PVR. There is less data on retinal detachment with PVR with and without buckles compared to without PVR with and without buckles. And that may well be the reason for this debate. Lots of the same challenges. PVR, remember, causes shortening and it causes star folds posteriorly, it causes loop traction and migration of the retina towards the vitreous space superiorly. But when you look at the data that's out there in comparative studies, both comparative and, and prospective, of whether or not you do a relaxing retinotomy, which is what you're forced to do with PVR if you're not going to use a buckle, versus a buckle without a relaxing retinotomy, if your reattachment rates are the same. So in the hands of a good surgeon, who can do comfortably a relaxing retinotomy retinectomy, there doesn't seem to be a difference in success rate. Remember, in these eyes, silicon oil was used in all cases, which doesn't rule out a long-acting gas, but just keep in mind that that's what was used. So what's my algorithm for doing this? Well, I'll do a vitrectomy with the membrane stripping, and if I get the retina completely flat after my air fluid exchange, then I think one could make a 
argument that you may not need a buckle. I generally use one. I feel more comfortable with it. But for those who say, I'm going to do peripheral laser, I've shaved down the vitreous space, I have no membranes, not necessarily a bad thing for a first surgery. If you've got mild peripheral traction or significant elevation and perhaps subretinal air, you've got to go back and do more membrane stripping. Then you come back again to that second level. And if you still have traction, a little bit of traction in the periphery, a buckle may take care of that or a retinectomy. I think that's surgeon's choice. If, on the other hand, you have subretinal air as you try to drain, you have no choice but to do a retinectomy. Um, and then finally, after doing that, we put in either a silicon oil or long-acting gas. Does a buckle work by pushing the retina in and overcoming vitreous traction? The answer is no. The buckle works by changing the shape of the retina. It stretches the retina. And so you get the greatest stretch right over the peak of the buckle. And so placing the buckle accurately is critical. You want to make sure that it is right under most of the breaks that you're looking to treat. So here's a case that, I, that, was sent, that came to me for a second opinion recently. Silicone oil, retinal detachment, no buckle, and my, six weeks after surgery, he feels things are getting worse. Uh, and this is the appearance. You can see a small break, just temporal to the fovea, not really involved in this. And when I had him on his back, the, the inferior periphery was very highly elevated. This does, picture does not do it justice, but anybody know what the pathology here in this case, why this retina is not flat? There's not, a lot of tra there's not a lot of membranes down below. What you can't see is there's subretinal silicone oil. And so there it goes back to you've got to release traction and you've got to do retinectomies when appropriate. How do you do the retinectomies? Diathermy. A lot of people would prefer scissors. I think the cutter is fine. Just keep the cutter facing relatively anteriorly because you don't want to shave off too much of your posterior retina. You want to salvage as much of that as possible. Here's a statement back from my, my old mentor, Reese Landers. Whenever you cut the retina, all the vision leaks out. What does that mean? It means that really back in the old days anyway, if you had an eye that required a retinectomy, you had an eye with poor visual acuity to begin with. But the reality is once you cut the retina, you can't go backwards. So just keep that in mind as you move forward and make that decision on retinectomy versus buckle. Uh, this is something I found, I think this is Dr. one of Dr. Rao's papers. Um, obviously in an eye like this, a buckle is of absolutely no value because you're not tamponading anything. Your peripheral retina is non-existent, so you don't need it. So in conclusion, vitrectomy alone is often sufficient for RDs without PVR. But for eyes with PVR, the buckle gives you support. A retinectomy in good hands probably is as good as a buckle, but there's no rule that says you can't use both. Do a retinectomy to relieve traction that you have to, and use a buckle to support other areas of attached retina where you're worried about future pathology. If you don't do the buckle, then do very meticulous dissection. Retinectomy, often your retinectomy needs to be larger than you think it does. Know the patient, also know your own skills. Try not to work outside your own comfort level um, but over time, learn how to use new skills. If you're not comfortable with retinectomies, by all means, use a buckle. But there are some cases where the retinectomy is going to be available, going to be absolutely required. So self-assess and evaluate your own response, your own success rates going forward. Thank you very much, and thank you for the exciting thank time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael Stewart. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, as usual, very clear and lucid as always. Uh, we're running a little back of time, but we'll take uh, some questions. And a lot of these areas are going to be talked about with uh, speakers, others in this session. So just in case you have a failure of buckle and you see a missed break, would you be uh, partial towards revising the buckle or going in for vitrectomy directly? So a lot of people would revise the buckle. Those that favor buckling initially, uh, assuming they've not put the buckle in the right place or they've only done maybe a a 180 degree buckle and you've got now a super break where you've got an inferior buckle. Uh, I hate revising buckles. There's a lot of scar tissue involved. A lot of things are happening. And if I think I can do that with a vitrectomy, I think it's an easier procedure and it's easier on my nerves. So bottom line is I'll usually go back and do a vitrectomy if a buckle has failed. So just the same question, Dr. Pramod and Dr. Lingam Gopal. Sir. Yeah, I you... think it's a two factor. I would look at location of the break and associated PBR. Probably Stiff retina PVR definitely you would go, but if it's buckleable, I mean, basic technically, how easy to buckle? Depending on that, I will take a call. Okay. Basically, if the same break has not properly buckled, 
but it makes sense to readjust the buckle. Or if it's so close to here that the buckle is not able to take care of it, then you go inside. But if the brake is well sealed and the act is RD, then you have to look for a new brake. If you cannot find it, I would rather go in and search for it rather than blindly buckle everywhere. That's what's good. And uh, in case you are doing, uh, there's a cataract also alongside, and uh, I mean, the cataract is fairly visually significant, and you feel that this is a case that you need a buckle and uh, vitrectomy, or versus the debate of, you know, buckle versus retinectomy, there's PVR there. So in a fresh uh, uh, cataract surgery, would you combine it with band because there's pressure on the eye from externally? Dr. Michael Stewart. So yeah, I, I have a fairly low threshold for actually doing cataract surgery combined when I need to. Uh, especially for peripheral dissection or for visualization, even posteriorly. So I will do that. Uh, I, I, you know, since you, if you're doing if you're doing purely a buckle, then if you suture your wound afterwards fairly well into two and a half millimeter wound, then you can raise the pressure to a reasonable degree and still have a tight anterior segment wound that should not be a problem. Um, and so I, I don't worry about that because. Uh, I, I do think that you can maintain the integrity and cheerily. Ravandeep, what do you feel? Uh, would you, when you're doing cataract surgery, PECO plus band plus uh, vitrectomy, uh, would you go ahead with all three, or would you, in cases where you're doing a fresh uh, PECO, would you favor doing retinectomy and going only with vitrectomy? Uh, I, I must admit that we don't we don't do uh, uh, combined there. Uh, we do it uh, a week before and then take up for the surgery. And uh, combined, if we have to do for the, not for the research. Dr. Mahesh, your quick thought on this. Can we have a mic here? As much as possible, we prefer not to do both together. But if it has to be, as Michael mentioned, it's not too much of an issue. You switch the wound, and okay. if you are proper, the way you tack the buttons and do the buckle is not. OK. Thank you. So we'll quickly move on and be a little backed up here. Uh, we're making a slight revision in the order because Dr. Sangeet has another talk in the other hall. So may I invite uh, Dr. Sangeet Mittal to speak to us on anterior PBR. Can we have, you. Some, have a slides up, please? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Anand. And thanks for allowing me to present early. So uh, I'll be speaking uh, on anterior PBR and because it's a greenhorn session, I'll just be keeping it very basic. So what is the anterior PVR now? Uh, the, the recent classification is the CA1 to 12. Uh, the PVR which is limited anterior to the equator, it's either focal, diffuse or circumferential, full thickness folds, uh, subretinal bands, it could be anterior displacement of the retina or it could be condensed vitreous with strands in the there. So what do you mean by all this terminology? The focal is the star folds, uh, the diffuse is the confluent star folds. The subretinal is the presence of any subretinal bands, clothes lines, or moth eaten sheets. The circumferential is the contraction along the posterior edge of the vitreous base with central displacement of the retina, uh, leading to a funnel shaped, PV, uh, funnel shaped retina. And uh, the peripheral retina is that case is a stretch, and the posterior retina is in the radial folds. And then the interior displacement is basically what is the interior loop traction. The vitreous base is pulled anteriorly, resulting in the peripheral retinal trough. And the CD processes may also be covered with the membrane in this uh, type of PVR. So I'll just describe the basic steps, uh, what need to be done for the management of anterior PVR. So if you have not put a buckle earlier in the previous, uh, or you are doing it as a primary, you add a still buckle or an encircling band, uh, then remove the focal or the diffuse star folds, then remove the posterior membranes, uh, do an ILM peeling, then remove the anterior circumferential bands, remove any subretinal traction in there, if you need, do a retinectomy and you do a silicon oil tamponade in these cases. So this is the first video uh, just showing the, these different steps. So this is to uh, show that and had a little, oh sorry, had an encircling band uh, in this patient, had undergone vitrectomy earlier and had a recurrence. Then you do a complete base excision. You have to remove all the vitreous that can be removed easily. You have to do a good base shaving. And you use intravitreal steroids also here to uh, see if there is any residual vitreous uh, left uh, and you can use that to remove that. And then you take care of the, any circumferential traction which is present. You remove these bands circumferentially uh, to remove all this uh, circumferential traction which is present along the vitreous space. 
and then you manage any uh, fixed poles uh, which are present posteriorly. So you take care of them, then you do uh, ILM peeling uh, and, and you do have to do an extensive ILM peel uh, which may extend even beyond the arcades uh, in, this, in this type of situations. This prevents any recurrence of epiretinal membranes or recurrence of PBR in the posterior pole uh, in the later, in post-operatively. So once you have done this, then you flatten the retina, uh, do a fluid air exchange and here you you may uh, use the dye again either to trypan blue or the green blue or whatever to see if there is any uh, residual uh, membranes present and then you can take care of them uh, at this stage and if in some patients you may need to do a relaxing retinotomy uh, retinectomy when this is not uh, when the membrane removal is not uh, feasible in those eyes, so do a relaxing retinotomy. An adequate amount of retinectomy has to be done to take care of all the pathology that is present. Then you do a circumferential 360 degree ando laser barrage, a prophylactic laser barrage, and you uh, laser around the retinal breaks also. So make the retina dry as, as dry as possible, and then you can use a silicon oil as a so sometimes in some situations you may land up with this uh, type of closed funnel RDs. In those cases, you sometimes have to do uh, to remove this, open up the funnel first. This anterior funnel is to be opened, and once the funnel is open, then you take care of the posterior PBR. So in these cases, you have to uh, remove the anterior PBR before you attempt to remove the posterior PBR because you would not be able to see it. So I, I have removed the, I have, take, I have used biomanual technique to open up this funnel and the stock of the membrane which was going down has now been removed and I see that there is a napkin ring formation and I use the pre-existing tear and uh, advance my forceps below the retina and remove this uh, subretinal band which is present there. This was causing traction. And I use, generally I, for these long bands, I use a hand-on-hand -hand technique uh, using two hands to remove this subretinal band. So this is just my last video, just shows this patient with the uh, anterior loop traction. And so if you see there's a, the anterior loop traction, there's a membrane and then there's a valley which there's a space between the retina and the membrane in that valley. So you can enter that space and you can introduce your forceps or your scissors in that to cut the membrane or to peel off the membrane. And uh, you take care of this membrane first, the posterior part of the membrane, you just peel it off. And again, you can use bimanual techniques to remove this membrane completely. And then once you have done this, you advance your, you keep on advancing uh, further circumferentially to take care of all this anterior loop traction and once you have removed this posterior membranes you take care of the membrane that is present anteriorly so thank you thanks for the thank you uh, sangeet for giving us an overview uh, but specifically to anterior pbr again uh, when you see a case a uh, pertinent question from dr uh, stewart stock would you go in with the uh, band or now have you completely shifted your practice to whole vitrectomy? No, I, I will uh, put an encircling band. You will put an encircling band. And do you have any uh, tips on how, uh, you know, pharmacotherapies for PVR? And I'll ask Dr. Lingam Gopal that also. I have tried actually uh, methotrexate intravitreal, but I, I don't, I didn't find any difference uh, using it uh, in those cases. Yeah, Dr. No experience using methotrexate, but I do, I do routinely treat them with steroids, hoping that it reduces inflammation and probably reduce the PVR, but I don't think I've tried any of this. Has anyone tried using tricot residue, you know, leaving some tricot residue for minimizing the recurrence of PVR in bad cases? Yes, Dr. Uh, I tried, but uh, somehow uh, it did not work. I think there is no substitute to clean Jodhi dissection, I think. Uh, good membrane dissection and relieving of complete traction, I think there is no substitute to that. And of course, closing all the breaks. Absolutely.
So it's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Manav Jyoti Burman, who's going to be talking a little more on this uh, techniques of uh, membrane removal and uh, PBR and subretinal diosis. Dr. Manav Jyoti. And thank you, Dr. Vihares, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this wonderful uh, meeting. Next slide, please. So I'm going to speak on techniques of membrane removal, PVR and uh, subretinal diosis. So retinal membranes are uh, the challenges in uh, retinal reattachment surgery, even in sometimes in the expert hand. And this may be in various types, like the pre-retinal, subretinal, it may form like seeds, it may form like folds, it may be like bands, uh, uh, and uh, it may be anterior, posterior, and sometimes it may be mature or immature, different types may be there. So this, uh, uh, membranes related to detachment are different from uh, diabetic membranes and as such the surgical approach is also different. So this is a video. Uh, did, uh, you can see a sheet of uh, membrane over the uh, posterior pole uh, with a cellular retinal detachment. So you do it, uh, then a complete vitrectomy. I've stained the membrane margins and I have re uh, removed the membrane from the edge very gently uh, with limited direction. And uh, after removal, we should do a uh, island peeling to prevent recurrence of the membrane and to relieve the uh, holes of the retina. So then I can do a uh, FC and if necessary, I can put some temporary but mainly the gas. So this is a uh, more extensive membrane. This is both an, an anterior retinal membrane and the posterior retinal uh, membranes are there in the traumatic uh, retinal detachment last year. So the membrane removal has been uh, tried from the posterior to anterior, uh, anterior approach to uh, avoid any uh, extra traction over the peripheral retina. So first the posterior pole is secured with the uh, LPFC. Then I have done an island peeling over the posterior pole. And then I have removed the uh, LPFC and gone uh, extended the break, the peripheral break and gone posteriorly. I have removed the uh, sheets of membranes mixed with some blood in the posterior, uh, behind the retina. And uh, once the retina is Freely mobile. Uh, I have uh, settled the retina with LPFC again and the uh, necessary laser and uh, silicon oil tamponite. So, so, this is another video. You can see this is a uh, band of uh, uh, single band of what a subretinal space. So, I have done a retinotomy far away from the fovea as well as uh, from the band itself, and I have uh, gone to the back of the retina with a forceps and uh, I have pulled the band. And I have made it free with gentle rotational movement, and I have removed as much of band, band as possible. And sometimes in this type of scenarios, all the band removal may not be possible. And as long as uh, uh, these bands does not create in reattachment of the retina in terms of functional and, and anatomical outcome, we can leave some amount of the band. And if uh, these are extensive and uh, put some traction on the peripheral retina, then we can add a well buckle also. So I have done a fluid gas exchange in this case and settled the retina with LPFC, uh, sorry, a silicon, um, uh, silicon oil and an original laser. So some, some part of the band I have removed the periphery without affecting the retinal readjustment. So this is uh, another uh, case. You can see uh, some lattice pattern of membranes uh, subretinally and I have made them um, on retinotomy and I have removed the uh, whole lattice in total from the superior aspect. There is a extensive lattice of uh, this bands in the nasal aspect of the retina extending to far periphery uh, anteriorly. So I have done another retinotomy. So I have approached to the subretinal space here on the nasal side again. And I have removed the whole sheet of membrane with uh, rotational moment of the forceps, uh, classically described as a uh, spaghetti technique. So most of the membrane has been removed without uh, affecting the uh, retina much, uh, extension in the retinotomy and the uh, retina is free enough now and I, I have settled the retina with LPFC again and uh, done necessary laser and uh, silicon oil tamponade with uh, LPFC exchange. So these are some of the cases that uh, we can um, approach in different ways. So in summary, a 
So it should be a proper evaluation of the every case before uh, going for a, a surgery in such, uh, how, how to start the case and which way to approach and keep full armamentary of basic equipments ready, particularly of course, peaks and uh, different types of uh, uh, scissors and all. And we should be a complete vitrectomy as much as possible. We should aim to release all correction and make retina mobile. And if necessary, you can leave some amount of membrane at periphery without affecting uh, function and anatomy outcome. Use PFPL generously. Do retinotomy and retinectomy judiciously to prevent, uh, to preserve as much of functional retina as possible. And bell buckle and bimanual surgery may be hel helpful in selective cases depending upon the surgeon's choice. And sometimes these uh, surgeries keep, uh, take lots of time and you should keep patience and uh, approach gently and you'll get the result. Thank you very much. Yeah, my question to Dr. Lingam Gopal would be, if you have a RD PBR nest, uh, you know, within the arcades, uh, how would you approach that? I mean, uh, any special techniques for that? Uh, how would you go with that? Subretinal, are you clever? Yeah, I think most subretinal fibrosis can be managed by peripheral retinotomies. Unless it's a continuous sheet like in traumatic PBRs, then of course you cut the retina 360 degrees or 180 degrees, fold it back and remove it. But with two properly placed retinotomies, you can actually access most of the subretinal space. Occasionally, you may have to have a third retinotomy, even if it's going 360 degrees. What I would choose is uh, the meridian of the sclerotomy. In the meridian of sclerotomy, or within the sweep from the sclerotomy, about 20 degrees, you make the retinotomy. Not too close to sclerotomy, but not too far posterior either. Because if you the farther away from the sclerotomy, you make the retinotomy, the more it will enlarge when you try to reach this side and that side. But the more closer you make to the sclerotomy, it becomes difficult to maneuver the forceps into subretinal space. So somewhere in between at the equatorial region. But as I said, within the sclerotomy area, if you make, it's easier to introduce it rather than making it somewhere at the, at the equator, horizontal median or a little below. If you make a retinotomy below, you cannot come upwards. You can only reach beyond that point, but not upwards. So you try to make two retinotomies on either side if required on both sides and reach. And you can actually reach right up to the optic disc. So each time you, you go to, to fold a membrane, so posteriorly you should understand that the space between the retina and the RPE is reducing as you go towards the disc. So there's a greater risk that you will plow into the choroid or you will uh, and cause hemorrhage. So you try to hug the retinal surface as you go down towards the disc and try to sort of fold the membrane first and pull not one hole, one grip and pull out. You're never 100% sure they're not also holding the retina. So pull a little bit, make it loose, or even better, just close blades, try to sweep it under the retina so it becomes loose, then hold it and try to pull from one side rather than pulling downwards. Downwards in the first place, you don't have space to pull. And in the second place, you you do, you are trying to, trying to dislodge it from both ends. That doesn't work out. So you pull from one side, and once it became loose from one side, then you pull from this. And then try to ro roll it out and take it out. As he said, ideally is to use bimanual, so use two forceps, hand over hand, very quickly you can remove it. And whatever is the residue is left, go from the opposite side and remove from this side. You can almost go up. So, Dr. Rajpal, sir, uh, do you have any favored instruments, uh, you know, that you would like to use, you know? Uh, for this, would you always go with your uh, regular forceps or do you always prefer to go with a subretinal forceps which has long blades or uh, how, how do you approach a case? We, are, we, we can have a long uh, forceps so that the distance covered is more and so have a less uh, damage to retina. That is our left. Uh, Dr. Can Pramod, yeah, 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 please. Basically, with the regular 25 gauge instruments now, what routinely being everybody using, Jaws are like the way it is a grip. Sometimes fine membranes are okay, but you don't get that firm grip. And chances are there when you hold it, it may snap there and you may not be able to pull out. So probably you need a broad jaws, like uh, you get a, 
servers, flat, broad shots, max say what we talk about something. Those type of forces. 20 gauge used to be easy, but when you're having using 20 or 25, this specifically like max grip would be better off to have a better grip so that you can have a traction and pull this. So Ramandeep, uh, if there is a complex network, it's like a net, and you know that if you have to remove the whole thing, there is a chance that there's a lot of cloth clothesline effect and uh, extension of that retinotomy. So would you go with multiple small areas of retinotomy, snip it, and leave a few of the glyotic bands right there instead of a very radical kind of removal? Yeah, absolutely right. If you can snip it, if they break, I mean, uh... Like all you're worried about the posterior pole. If you're taking care of the posterior pole or the optic nerve, then it's fine. But if it's in the periphery, if, if you're able to snip it, uh, it's, it's fine. It works very well. Uh, I, I must imagine that, uh, I must tell you that there's another technique which I saw Mirai is doing, that going subretinally. Yeah, going to, that's the next question, actually. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go it's, it's subretinally doing it, but uh, I, I, I read about it, but I saw it last time. On, yeah. Right now, but Rohan again, also shows some. Change something. every membrane. You can, you know, leave the peripheral membrane, and if they break in between, don't have to change them. Doctor Stewart, yo. Yeah, we've heard lots of great techniques about how to address the subretinal membranes, and that the only question I would ask is how to identify which ones need to be removed and which ones don't. Because many of these can be left in place and they don't actually, are, are they're not a big part of the problem. And so one is, if you're going after them, what I find is if you have two ends that are highly attached, but everything in between is not, or you get easy to release it in between, and simply cutting the membrane by secting it may prevent you from causing inadvertent damage to the other side. The other thing I would say is if you're uh, if you just got some bands and not the sheets, which we think are worse, then do your fluid exchange after you've released all the rest of the traction and then look and see what happens. If there's no tinting of the retina over the membrane, then the membrane itself probably is not contributing to the detachment. If you do have tinting, you put your fluid back in and then you go after and either cut or remove. So keep that in mind that not all need to be removed and they should be assessed individually. So, Dr. Um, Stewart, since you're here, there's a question for you uh, from the audience by Vivek. Uh, your views on using a 42 band or maybe I'll say even a 240 band, a 4 mm band or a 2.5 mm band, instead of the larger ones, 276, uh, 277, and uh, views on 360 degrees peripheral barrage laser in PVRRDs. So m yeah, generally, if I don't have PVR and I'm doing a case where I feel I want to get some encircling at the vitreous base, I'll use a 240 band. Uh, I, I've never used a 42. I, I know people that do. It's a little bit wider, and it's probably a good choice, maybe even a better choice than a 240. Um, for an eye that I'm really worried about broad-based vitreous base issues, I'll use a 287. Uh, 276, I think, is a really good buckle, but where I think it works best is for dialyses. And I think a 287 is better for a PBR type case where you're worried about more the, vitre the posterior vitreous base rather than the insertion of the aura. Thank you, uh, uh, panel and vice council. Uh, we'll go straight to the next talk. Uh, my pleasure to invite my friend and colleague and head of the Department of uh, Retina Service in Arvind Chennai, Dr. Saranan VR, over speak on tips in uh, radial retina. Can I have my slides? Uh, thanks once again. Uh, first, we are talking about uh, the relaxing retinectomy. We should know that uh, what are the cases where you would uh, uh, revert to this extreme uh, option. And uh, it's only it's supposed to be the last resort and not to the go to panacea for every case of uh, pale dark. So it should be the very last thing we should do. Uh, and don't do it as a routine uh, uh, step. So, what are the indications? Uh, mainly, when there is retinal stiffness due to either uh, anterior, especially in surface PVR along the vitreous base, when there is a subretinal PVR which cannot be addressed to small retinotum, especially in the chronic cardiac, the uh, multiple sheets can be there. When there is intrinsic retinal contracture or fibrosis of the vitreous space, which can be of either circumferential or anterior, when there is anteretinal displacement as well. And occasionally in case of trauma, where there is retinal incarceration and also sometimes in myopia, to relax retina because retina does not conform to the globe curvature. He said, uh, call, this used to be called the air traction test by my teacher, Dr. Sunil. When you are doing an air exchange and the air migrates into the subretinal space, that means that your retinal uh, release of traction is not adequate. So you have to do something extra to deal with this. So the main goal is to relax the retina so that it can conform to the uh, globe curvature. 
and also to release any adherent uh, vitreous or membranes in the anterior surface especially. So here are some examples of uh, regarity. Here you can see that there is a PRD after uh, uh, SOR. You can see the membranes are there and you can uh, first before going to the periphery always make sure that you deal with all the posterior membranes and remove it thoroughly. You can do the ILM peeling also and after performing all these peeling techniques then you look at the uh, peripheral uh, retina. You can do ILM peeling here doing here. And then uh, you try to look at the peripheral retina. If you feel it is stiff, then you can go ahead with your relaxed retinectomy. But before resorting to all these steps, uh, first make sure that you have released all the traction in the post pole and this should be the last resort. Once you clear everything and finally realize that it is still not safe enough, then you can go for this. In this case, the temporal retina was quite stiffer and I had done a temporal 180 degree retinectomy and doing laser under uh, 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 PFC and then shooting to avoid. So retinectomy, the level of the retinectomy should be just behind the level of the posterior vitreous space. If it's anterior, you can do the very anterior, if the vitreous space is anteriorly placed, then you can do a, a really anterior vitrectomy. Again, this is a reality, and you can see that uh, the vitreous base is anterior. Whether to cauterize and then cut or cut, cut and cauterize is up to you. So if there are sometimes in very thin retina, like myopic arteries, the bleed is very less, and you can uh, cut and then do, do a little bit of minimal cauterize the bleed is. But if it's a very vascular retina where the vessels are very dilated, then you can do a pre cautery and then cut. Previously used to use scissors, but nowadays with all the my MIVS instruments, cutter itself is easy to do a peripheral retinectomy. And the, as I told you, the retinectomy, if the vitreous base is anteriorly placed, you can you can just do anterior uh, retinectomy. But if vitreous base, sometimes you have a very posterior migration of the posterior vitreous base, then you cannot do anterior vitrectomy because the adherent vitreous at the edge of the RR is going to roll up and cause recurrent RD either on table or in the post-operative period. So in these cases, you have to do a uh, posterior retinectomy. Like in this case, this is actually an unusual case. Normally, I don't do retinectomy as in the first uh, surgery. But here, this patient was a very poor complaint patient coming from a peripheral area, not very uh, well to do. And he had a very posterior, large sort of a radial tear with a very posteriorly placed vitreous base. So after, uh, there was not much uh, p wear in the posterior part, but mainly the anterior vitreous was contracted. So after doing all the ILM peeling and everything, after injecting PFCL, so I'm, I, lo I look at the uh, peripheral uh, retina, if it is more vertically oriented and when you try to push with the instrument, if the bounce back is very fast, here you can see there's a there's sort of a ring contraction there and it's sort of vertical tinting of the vitreous base area. In these cases, it's not going to uh, settle with just uh, oil and the oil is going to migrate through this posterior uh, uh, large uh, tear. Even if I put a buckle also, the, the buckle will not cover this very posterior radial sort of tear. In these cases, you, you can do to resort to a uh, uh, sort of a primary uh, uh, retinectomy here. I did a three stage retinectomy because the posterior phase process was very, very posterior and very contracted. So, and after PSL, even though it looks bad, I, I feel this sort of uh, technique will uh, have a higher success than doing a uh, just a plain surgery without doing a retinectomy. Some trauma cases uh, here you can see that there is a very ring contraction of the anterior vitreous base. And here, without doing a retinectomy, you're not going to settle this retina. So, when we are doing a retinectomy here and removing it all. Again, this has to be a 3 degree retinectomy. So one more is sometimes you can do retinectomy at a silicon oil in a RRD patient without removing the silicon oil. But here the technique is that you have to do high suction with the core mode. After again peeling all the post PBR, I realize that there is stenting of the peripheral retina. So you can do cautery here because I don't want bleeding to happen under oil. And with high suction and high slightly low cut rate, you can do a nice retinectomy here also. So in traumatic RDs, again you can see it's a, here's, there's a scleral tear here and the retina is incarcerated there. So to, we have to release this retina from the incarcerated wound there and we have to release that. So we need a retinectomy in these cases. And here one more case of uh, inferior temporal uh, uh, incarceration here. So again, we are releasing the retina from the inferior scleral wound. So here a localized double perforation case. We have a localized incarceration there. So we can do a localized retinectomy to release the tracking from that area and relieve the retina. So there are trauma cases where you can resort to uh, this is one more case of a napkin band with subretinal blood. I could not, I was not able to identify why the retina was not settling down, was not open, funnel was not opening up. But once we went into the sub RP, uh, subretinal space, you can see the plain RP there. And here I'm removing the uh, tight, very tight napkin band just ab above the optic nerve. So unless this was released, the funnel would not open. So this was not able, I'm not, not able to identify working from the top. So I had to go under the retina to identify this napkin band and remove it. Last case would be the myopia. Sometimes there's a failure of the myopic RD, the, the persistent macular hole, by doing a peripheral uh, temporal retinectomy and causing an intentional retinal slippage. So apart, you can do a myopic buckle, but if you don't have access to a myopic buckle, here I'm, what I'm doing is an intentional uh, retinal slippage by doing a peripheral uh, temporal uh, retinectomy so that the retina can slip down and conform to the uh, 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 glow posterior staphylone. 
So in cases where uh, sometimes we feel that a VRD can happen when we are doing a large inferior rectectomy, sort of this compartment barrage described on a German uh, VR surgeon, I feel it helps in, and this is a case of a post SOR uh, photograph showing the uh, grid barrage in the place, prevents recurrence uh, when we are doing an inferior one deep rectectomy. RP stripping described by ski pens nowadays is not that very popular, but in case you are uh, fancy, just uh, using a low suction, you can uh, under the air, you can strip. So the light brown color will be the end point of RP stripping to prevent recurrent PVR. But I feel it's not, it doesn't work well. Initially, it's a lot of cases. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Salman, for excellent talk and beautiful videos. So uh, first question to Dr. Pramod Gwende, sir. Uh, when you have to do a complete 360 degree uh, uh, relaxing retinectomy, how do you prevent, you know, a retinal twist, which sometimes can happen when the retina is pretty stiff and a chronic RD? Any tips there? Yeah, most of the time now, because we are easy access to be a perfluorocarbon. Probably we start once, but to ensure all the traction is real. That's the most important thing, because even if the PF is the residual traction and that one particular cotton retina can get pulled up. So really all the traction and probably I put a small bubble on PFCL, cut something, a few areas, add on some more. Uh, and once you are beyond arcade or maybe mid periphery, and then complete the retinotomy, probably most of the time it holds on. Don't want to start, put too much to start with because when you start cutting on one side and that tug on the other side, it flips. And in fact, PFCL can go in a subretinal space and then it whole thing twists more than uh, probably. There are some people who have suggested even leaving tags. I think even Saravanan does that. So what do you think about uh, in cases of basically PVR, leaving small tags so that the retina, I mean, the retina doesn't, you know, twist around the optic nerve. Any experience that though? Usually you don't complete the retinectomy until the last step. And the last step, once you put PFCL and macula is actually fixed, then you cut off the those two small strands so you don't rotate it. But actually, if it rotates, sometimes you reduce the PFC level and you can actually derotate it by using the flu pump. So there's not a major issue. And for a patient who is recovering from basic division, a distorted retina probably may not make so much difference. I'm not, I'm not talking about MAPLA at 6 o'clock. Can I ask two questions to Dr. Savano? So I thought in, the, in some cases where the vitreous base is very posterior, instead of Directly going and doing a retinectomy right at the point, we can make an attempt to shift the vitreous base anteriorly. Sometimes I found that using a bimanual dissection, using forceps and scissors, you can actually try to shift the vitreous not base anteriorly. Only if it is not possible, you have to cut. That's one possible. Second thing is I found that when you did laser along the retinectomy, you are almost producing about five to seven rows. Four to five rows. Yeah, so I would rather produce only three rows, only for one reason, that these are all eyes prone for recurrence. But the recurrence, when you keep on cutting off edges and edges of retina, you know, you're left with not much retina to work with. I, I would prefer to put just minimum rather than mine. So, uh, one more question again, uh, which is on mind, and also Dr. Jayesh has asked this. Uh, your take, uh, Dr. Ramandeep, on uh, relaxing retina retinectomy under fluid vis a vis relaxing retinectomy under air. So, I mean, like you, ask the wrong, uh, you ask me the wrong person. Actually. Okay, then so sorry. I have, in yeah. my career, I have not done, you know, half a dozen, not more than half a dozen. We all oh, okay. we taught like that to, to add buckles, add 277, 279. Okay. R is a death sentence if we do, uh, if we do it, not only if we not do. So I have not done uh, this thing. But I can answer your question because we have, we have done for traumatic uh, incarceration and all that. Uh, for my choice is uh, under air. I agree okay. with what Dr. Charles says. I do it under air. Yeah. Tarun, your take on that? Uh, it's a personal favorite I of hate, mine. I hate doing under air because uh, bleeders tends to clump and it, it, it does not diffuse out and it tends to be good to I usually use pottery after cutting. So I don't prefer under air. Uh, okay. That's my so Personally, I, I prefer doing it under air for two reasons. One, it gives me a wide view. It minimizes, it takes off all the bleeding and it gives you the extent that one needs to do. So one can keep cutting and then deciding how much that need, you need to go ahead. In fact, that was another question coming up. So, uh, so Dr. Rajpal, uh, many people in the West do not like using diatomy at all in the periphery. Uh, do you use diatomy uh, as when you, when you go ahead with retinectomy? How do you, how do you proceed? Yes, we are using diatomy. So that whenever there is a bleeding area is there, if it is not bleeding, then we don't use uh, in an old, old RDA and all this. Ideally, to prevent bleeding, 
my bad habit. Thank you. A few more questions. We'll we'll proceed. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Regarding retinectomy and the rat, uh, I have I have two issues. One is like the seeing where the vitreous is attached under rat. Number one. Number two is if there is significant traction, the rat can go into the subretinal space. So how do you handle these two? For me, is uh, it's a marker for me to show the extent of the uh, retinectomy, and if that's going underneath, then I would. That means that that retina is stiff, and it's it's a marker that it's stiff and it's not going to fall down. So I just cut a little more. So that's it. Yeah. Once air goes underneath, the thing changes. So where you want to cut is not very obvious. So yeah, actually, under air you I, you don't even have to cut. You can just diathermize. It'll it'll give way. But then once it goes underneath, the anatomy changes. That either the retina can stick posteriorly or the air goes underneath it gets stretched the rest of the retina so it and it can I would like inadvertently tear the retina where you don't intend to that's what i was asking only counter to that is it shows you more and uh when you are already inside air so that air will flatten the retina once you just release that little bit of traction so it's also a technique described by dr charles so we'll move ahead it's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Dhanashree Ratra, very experienced senior consultant from Shankar Netralia, to talk to us on my tips to handle RD with PBR. Dr. Dhanashree. Thank you very much. Uh, and I thank Dr. Mahesh Mugam and BRSI for this invitation. Uh, most of the things have already been discussed, so my job is easy. I'm probably just going to summarize all the things that have been told to you so far. So the, my talk is on my tips on how to handle RD with PBR. Uh, so, not all cases of uh, PBR are simple and easy to handle. Some of them can be like this, where you, know, you have to abandon the case because of failure to open the uh, funnel. So, the tips are basically to avoid such kind of uh, unfavorable outcome. Uh, so, the number one tip is that planning of sclerotomies. The most important uh, thing that you will do is plan your sclerotomies in such a case, especially the placement of infusion cannula, because uh, you know, well begun is half done. So, uh, make sure, so this is one uh, video which you can see. This is a case, a traumatic case with uh, retina is very pulled anteriorly and as I begin the surgery itself, I realize that the, something is not good and the cannula is actually under the uh, retina. So it is important to make sure that the cannula is in correct place and it is not in a subretinal position. You can either change the position of the cannula and then reinsert and then go on with your uh, case. And uh, so this is the next video where you can see there is a large uh, tear inferiorly, almost 180 degree tear is there the actual lens has been expelled out and so you would expect the vitreous in the retina to be incarcerated inferiorly. So uh, inferiorly I have not placed any sclerotomy in the inferior half so all the sclerotomies are superiorly and the infusion cannula is placed at 12 o'clock. So this is and of course this patient had a retinal incarceration inferiorly and had the infusion cannula been placed inferiorly you would have had more trouble in managing the case because the retina would have got even further uh, damaged. And this is some extreme case where you see that the retina is almost uh, at the pupillary margin. There is uh, uh, no space at all to give sclerotomy. So here one anterior chamber maintainer is used. And I'm using uh, actually uh, forceps through the limbal incisions to try and remove the membranes. And once the retina becomes slightly mobile and falls back, then probably you can make your sclerotomies and go ahead with your surgery. So however, these are extreme cases, but if uh, it is... Uh, good to take precautions and plan your sclerotomies properly. So number one, number two tip is that meticulous removal of membranes. For your surgical success, it is very essential that you do meticulous removal. All the membranes should be removed and so all the crevices and folds, you must check all the crevices and folds for any membranes and remove the membranes well. The start from posterior and then come to anterior because if you do the anterior membrane removal first, the anterior retina becomes mobile and then your posterior retina becomes trapped, you won't be able to remove membranes posteriorly. So remove the membranes thoroughly from all the entire uh, retina. Spend enough time in doing this because this will really pay dividends in a good surgical success. Now some patients will have subretinal, oh, I'm sorry. Some patients will have subretinal membranes. So. Uh, Along with the uh, pre-retinal membranes, you also have to look for subretinal membranes. And uh, we have had uh, nice discussions about the removal of subretinal membranes with nice videos. So make sure that you do a, a good removal of the subretinal membranes as well. So number three is the role of liquid purpurolo carbon. And uh, this, uh, you are, this basically PFCL is your friend in this situation. So PFCL, uh, use the PFCL liberally. Don't be uh, you know, uh, hesitant in using it. 
PFCL will help you in two ways. One is that it will stabilize your posterior retina while you work anteriorly and remove the membranes, etc. And second thing is it, it will also give you an idea whether your retina is going to settle or no. So definitely PFCL is very much useful in cases of PVR and it can be used uh, very liberally uh, as, as in PVR cases. So now next tip number four is the role of encircling gland. And we have had an excellent discussion by uh, the Professor Stewart. So you know that the, the, uh, the uh, belt buckle, the encircling band or even the buckle which uh, reduces the traction if by pushing the peripheral uh, uh, posterior wall and the scleral wall inside. So if you have uh, say a uh, focal traction, focal PVR, this can be definitely taken care by either by encircling band or even a buckle placement. You heard Dr. Ramandeep Singh just mentioning that PVR can be tackled by buckle also without resorting to retinotomy. So a buckle placed in the correct position to relieve the traction can help you manage your uh, RD with uh, focal traction or even one quadrant uh, PVR. So next is that uh, take care of the anterior retinal tissue. This is my uh, tip for uh, you know budding surgeons. Uh, most often when you do a large retinotomy which is very posterior and you leave the anterior retina as it is, that creates a problem because this anterior retina is the redundant tissue and it can get contracted and cause further recurrence. So if you, when you are leaving a large retinal tissue, make sure that either you can take care by doing laser or cut it off completely so that you do not have any uh, tissue left. Third thing is that uh, adequate retinectomy. So when you have a, uh, extensive uh, uh, contraction, uh, make sure that your retinotomy is uh, adequate. So uh, again, uh, we are again just had some uh, good discussion about the extent of retinectomy and how to do. Make sure that your retinectomy is so complete that it uh, completely addresses the area of uh, uh, traction. One uh, your point is that you go from one area of uh, adherent to the other. So if you have a recurrent case, you will have areas of cryoretinal, uh, cryopexy or chorioretinal adhesions. So go from one chorioretinal adhesion to another chorioretinal adhesion so that you can have relief of traction along with the retinal reattachment. Number seven is role of ILM peeling. Again, this is a very debatable uh, issue. We just had uh, some discussion on that. Uh, personally, I don't think that each and every case of PVR requires any ILM uh, removal, but uh, it does have some role in uh, preventing epiretinal membrane formation and reducing the recurrence rate. So it can, uh, no and no visual benefit is added. So I feel that the ILM peeling has a role in say mild PVR or in preventing PVR in a regmatogenous RD. But if you have a very advanced PVR, closed funnel and all, there is no role of uh, ILM peeling in such a situation. And number eight is role of steroids. So uh, again, it was mentioned about pharmacotherapy for uh, PVR. So uh, we are not yet sure about any pharmacotherapy. Even the role of steroids is also not yet uh, you know, confirmed. This was a publication from Shankaretra way back in 2005, where uh, oral steroids were given in patients of RD with parental detachment. And it was seen that the oral steroids do have a role in preventing recurrence and PVR formation. But uh, there are uh, uh, studies where triamcinolone has also been uh, used to prevent PVR. But triamcinolone has not been shown to be significantly uh, causing any uh, change in the PVR. And in fact, the tri transcendental crystals were seen to cause toxicity. So uh, you use judiciously if you at all you want to use. Personally, I don't use any transcendental for PVR. So the, these uh, eight tips I think uh, will be beneficial, useful for you. Take home message would be plan your sclerotomies properly, especially the infusion cannula in appropriate area. Remove all preretinal as well as subretinal membranes. Use PFCL to stabilize your posterior retina. Encircling band can support the peripheral retina, so use it judi judiciously. Role of ILM peeling and role of steroids is again controversial. Maybe you can use it based on case-to-case -case basis. And thank you so much for your kind attention. And please, I invite you for our Retina Summit next year. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh, for your fantastic talk and wonderful videos. Uh, uh, just to take off from the point about PFCL, your experience, your take on very severe PVR, leaving PFCL as short-term, mid-term, tamponade, and then revisiting the case later. What are your thoughts on this? So I personally don't do that because I feel that uh, most of the patients are not willing for any resurgery so early in a uh, you know, post-operative period. And also if the LPFC has flattened the retina on table, then it's well and good you can replace it with silicon oil. So in situations where the PFCL is not flattened, then there is no point in leaving it also. Uh, 
maybe you I, I maybe you can think of using Densiron uh, as a high density, but PFCL leaving, I, I'm not uh, in favor of that. Dr. Pramod, what is your take on this? Answering question, I am somehow personally not in favor of leaving PFCL inside the IPRO. Yeah, I agree with the Nashri watches. Okay, Dr. Bora, uh, do you do? I'm also not in favor of uh, this thing, but sometime in a one night patient GRT, earlier time when inventory used to be left, there used to be less information. That's the my uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal, your take on uh, visco dissection for posterior uh, PVR. Have you used that? And then Sarvan and I know Sarvan a couple of times. Sarvan, yes. Visco dissection. Yeah. For RRB. Uh, no, yeah, PBR and for handling severe membranes procedure to get that plane. Uh... For PDR patients, some people have tried. I don't fancy because this co uh, injecting forcefully can again cause it. it can the loose membrane. It can create a plane between just the just macula and the membrane. Plane, yeah. But for advanced, I mean senior surgeons, that is not a big advantage because you can easily identify the plane. In a tougher membrane, when you inject forcefully, it can create additional tears. For established surgeon, I don't think visco dissection offers any big uh, deal. Uh, in PDR, I don't, I'm not sure about RRD, I've never used it. So, uh, Padmaja asks this question of continuous burns for barrage versus scatter burns. Uh, Ramandeep, you want to take that? Uh, so, uh, this, because this has been introduced very shortly, the continuous burn, I think. Uh, the propagators are saying that it, 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 you need a single row for that. You, you are creating uh, less thing. Unless until uh, there is a randomized trial, I really can't say, but I have used both, both work well. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? May I ask uh, yeah, a question? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so this is regarding management of anterior retina. I have a patient where uh, he has undergone primary surgery, uh, 360 degree laser has been done and uh, the patient uh, has attached posterior retina but there is a frill of anterior retina which is getting detached anterior to the laser burns. The vision is very well maintained, patient is asymptomatic but over a period of time can this uh, strip of retina which is getting detached 360 can that cause complications like hypotonia and should such cases be dealt with? Should we be going inside again and doing retinotomy there? Can I answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. 100%. Uh, when, you have, when you have a la la large clock hours, you're having 360 degree, so all the 12 clock hours, it is 100% going to cause complications down the line, probably not now, but after two, three years, it's going to produce clear uh, body shallow cerebral detachment, fibers of the vitreous space, NBI, deepening of the AC and hypotonia, and that is irreversible. Once that happens, it is irreversible. Do whatever you want to do, do it now before the mission drops. Yeah. And that's why I would prefer and that happened once we remove the oil. Till the oil is in, it's okay. Correct. So that's exactly the statement what he used. Laser all the break are around 360 degree. Doing a so-called barrage laser 360, leaving anterior break open, that's not a solution. And that is what you land up in problem with the ring detachment peripheral. Right. So the there were no breaks which were left unlasered. It was after doing laser to the breaks. A additional 360 degree laser was done so still something has opened anterior to the no, the uh, fact it is open up the detachment is there there means some break is there yeah absolutely so simple absolutely. absolutely okay thank you for the want of time we'll just move on we'll tell a bunch of questions we'll take it as it comes to the end so it's my pleasure to invite a young budding uh, surgeon dr thirumlesh guy with full of ideas uh, he's going to talk to us on lens management young versus old natural lens versus pseudophagia and when to remove retain and P do PIs long topic. Okay. Uh, thank you, VRSI, uh, 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 for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, while discussing PVR, I think uh, lens management seems uh, something which is which only has to do with uh, you know the visualization. I was thinking about this topic, how to go about this. Uh, you know, do I show lens to me? Do I show putting uh, an IOL or a removal of IOL? But then I thought I'll keep it relevant to the discussion of, uh, the, the, you know, the session that uh, the function of the lens removal or, you know, how to manage the lens is with reference to the view of it. So this is a Miyagi Apple view. If you look into the eye, so uh, we took a photograph in a cadaveric eye. So I put uh, uh, cannulas at uh, various places. So you can see the one which is at four millimeter gives you, uh, you know, a good access of cutting around the vitreous without uh, touching the lens. As you move more and more closer, 
the chances of the lens that becomes now you know uh, very very likely however why is it important to note this positions from inside is because whenever we are talking about doing a base shaving or talking about dissection at the vitreous base that is the space that we have and the, the visualization can only be done in two ways either you do a good indentation or you remove the barrier which is there which is the natural lens so one can think about doing either a lensectomy or a pecor mensification depending upon where is the pathology that you want to visualize and how you want to perform it. Now, uh, you know, if you cut open the eye at the equator, you can see uh, uh, these two important aspects. Uh, you, the anterior part of it just behind the, uh, you know, beyond the ciliary body, you know, that's where beyond that is the vitreous base and, you know, the anterior previa. The space axis there is is what is the critical point of discussion. So you can also see that, you know, if, if the capsule is wrinkled and calcified like this, it will not give you a view to operate in that space. So if you are having a pseudopathic patient, although you, with indentation, you can reach there without, uh, you know, lens it becomes something which is not really significant. But if the capsule is not allowing you to see, you, you would face a problem in operating there and doing the dissection. So, it's all the more necessary that, you know, patients who are having capsules which are opaque, you can remove them. So, uh, what is the advantage of removing is that it will give you an optimal visualization of the whole vitreous and, uh, you know, it will give you access to the vitreous base. You can do a good thorough vitrectomy around its entire circumference and you can also remove the condensed vitreous gel attached to the anterior edge of the giant air PBR. And because we are removing uh, you know, all these anterior vitreous and the membranes there, it will further decrease the occurrence of anterior pain. So, uh, the other thing, the other advantage of removing the lens would be that it will avoid subsequent media changes when you are doing post-operative monitoring. So, if there is a media problem, whether be it, be it the lens itself or be it pseudopecae itself, you know, you can, uh, you have to think beyond that to, to think that, you know, should I remove it or Now, what is the disadvantage of removing the lens? Apecia can make, uh, you know, ocular tamponade difficult because you either you put oil or gas, the tamponade is not going to be very effective. And intraocular lens power calculation uh, is often uh, uh, difficult because there is a detachment and you cannot place the lens. So, you know, leaving the patient affected probably is a good idea. And when you're removing the oil, you can probably think about. Uh, So this is a video where it's a fake patient with a good indentation and over a period of time, if you know how to uh, reach there without touching the lens, you can see that the vitreous based dissection can be done even in a fake patient. But if the indentation is a little anterior, like you saw just before, the ciliary process becomes more and more prominent. So once that happens, it, you mean that you're moving more closer and probably your cutter might touch the lens. I'll show you another case where, uh, you know, uh, this was the post ICL. I decided to uh, do a lensectomy on, on the table. But if you look at it, whether the patient is fake or fake, it's all about, you know, reaching that space at the vitreous base to, to match. So coming to the original topic given, so if there is a natural opacity, if it is the, the patient is older, do a fake or if the, if the lens is soft, then you can do a lensectomy. If the patient is pseudophagic with a very dense capsular opacity, which is not allowing you to see, you can plan an explantation with capsulectomy. If it is a natural IOL where you feel that the tamponading agent might come forwards or there is a drug subluxation, you can consider either a lensectomy or an explant depending upon whether it is natural or artificial lens. The last one was when do one does, when does one do a PI? Uh, you know, if the patient is epic or if the patient is your as an ACIOL, then you do a uh, and do PI again. Again, if there is an iris law and you know, you're going to plan an oil tamponade, then doing an anti would be a good idea. In conclusion, uh, VR surgery is all about the view. So, sacrificing the lens when compared to, you know, non-visualization of the anterior people and also the GIT, you know, is not a question at all. And more often, it's a personal inclination. If you can indent and do it, then it's great. If you're not doing it, then, you know, as well remove it so that you reach the space where the surgery is better. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Thirumlesh. Uh, this is a topic that's often missing. And uh, a quick question to uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal. Uh, oh, sir, is it? I'm sorry. Mike. Thirumlesh uh, dealt with one aspect that's the visualization of the during the surgery, but actually the purpose of giving this talk was like in case of pseudophagia, when you have air coming into the anterior chamber, the oil is likely to come into the anterior chamber. So those were the situation. Another one is RD with anterior PVR, these patients can land up with low IOP because the body is shut down. In that situation, if you have to remove the lens, then the patient is likely to get, get develop a keratop, like silicon oil keratopathy. Third one was role of PI in uh, in a pseudophagic eye, where you're putting an oil when the art comes in that way. Those are the situations if the panel can discuss that would be useful to them. Yeah, we'll take the uh, last one first. Uh, the very pertinent question. Nowadays, we do a lot of um, MIVSO and a lot of uh, FACO combined with uh, vitrectomy. So my question to Dr. Lingam Gopal is, uh, do you do a PI in all these cases uh, to prevent, you know, pupillary blocks? And that was what is there in the textbooks uh, earlier. So you're taking it. If it's pseudophatic and there is no evidence of chondrodesis throughout your surgical procedure, I won't put in, I won't make a PI. But if there is a suggestion of a chondrodesis <laughs> or when you are doing fluid gas exchange, one of the is coming to the AC, then I would be more inclined to it. So, uh, this is, even if you are doing the FACO with the vitrectomy, you don't regularly do PI. Dr. Borai, he names, how is the practice? We are not doing that as a good doctor. So, Dr. Pramod, how do you uh, prevent, uh, sometimes once in a while, rarely you find cases of pupillary block. You always find that uh, Iris Bombay and that uh, PAS happening almost uh, in uh, sync with the circum uh, capsule rexus margin. So, in such cases, I mean, do you do anything to prevent uh, this? How do you do pupillary management post-operatively to prevent this? Just no, to extend actually, the question. Actually, what we need to do is to keep pupil mobile. The most important thing is uh, now, because of MIVS and most of the time we are injecting through superior sclerotomy, the direction of cannula generally is not an issue now. Because otherwise, your cannula tilts and then the air or gas, particularly, uh, sorry, silicon oil getting pushed through the zonules sometimes. Even though zonules are intact and if your cannula tilts and you're pushing the uh, bit, uh, like uh, oil within the zonules, you can suddenly you start seeing somewhere some cotton AC becomes shallow, iris sometimes start becoming convex that area. That can be a clue for you. But uh, as long as, I mean, that's precaution you have to take during injection. And later, post-surgery, if the post capsule is intact, that's another issue. And if it is intact, probably keeping people mobile in a post operative period, I think that takes care of most of the time. OK, for because we almost uh, backed out, we'll move on. Well, and it's my pleasure to invite a friend, Dr. Naresh Babu, heads the retinal service in Madurai, uh, to speak to us on handling complications. Naresh, can you yeah, have a slides up, please? Uh, slides, please. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, VRSA, for the invite. And before I start, I've got two disclaimers. Number one, there are only three persons who will not be having a complication. One, he must be a god. Second thing, he may not be operating. And third, he may be a liar, and unfortunately, I don't fall into any of the category. So I've got enough share of my complication. And second disclaimer is, I thought this was for greenhorns. I don't find any greenhorns here. So <laughs> I'll skip all the so-called the theoretical parts. So when I am skipping the slides, please close your eyes for a moment so that it will not disturb your eye. OK? So straight away, we'll go to the video. So first one is, uh, uh, I'll not be discussing about the, uh, the common, uh, what do you call the complications which you come across like managing the bleeding or all those things because over a period of time will become massive. This is one of a case with RD with uh, uh, surgery done with buckle. But of course, the other eye was six by six. But in this case, whether to operate or not was the question. But uh, for me, even if the patient gets an ambulatory vision in that eye, it is a must to operate and any number of attempts is uh, good actually. So this case, what we did is basically we went inside a 20 gauge vitrectomy. And when uh, we operate a case like this with a closed funnel, uh, I, I used to uh, remember only one thing. You remember uh, Nar Suki noodle, noodles, which was promoted by Kajal. Kajol, Kajol, I don't have any financial interest. They say you eat and drink, eat and drink. Like that, uh, just remove the membrane posteriorly, fill it with PFCL, remove the membrane P PFCL so that it doesn't get migrated. So we have uh, opened the funnel. So after that, we just inject the PFCL, flatten it, 
don't fully fill it because it will definitely go under the retina. As I was telling, after this, you now cow are done, now go for PO. So you peel the membrane, go to the next stage. And this was the final result. And after the S1, this patient was maintaining 6 by 60 vision only. Okay. So again, I'll just uh, skip this. We come across a lot of uh, uh, bands. And uh, only thing is when you are removing the subretinal band, which is uh, one which is complicated in all these, uh, what do you call the uh, realities, it's very disturbing. And you have to use the right instrument. And as uh, it was discussed earlier, it's better to go for uh, what you call the max grip. Again, I don't have any financial interest. So we have seen a lot of uh, videos where we have removed the cloth uh, line. Like you just make a retinotomy, adjacent to the thing, and you remove the membrane like this. And sometimes uh, people have shown bimanual, all those things. But I prefer uh, uh, going for a subretinal approach. So in this case, nowadays I don't do vitrectomy. This was a previous video where you do the vitrectomy. I really don't do the vitrectomy as soon as you see the membrane. Just straight away go for the membrane removal. So what we do is take a 25 gauge cannula, it should be valve cannula, so that it doesn't leak, preferably a brand new cannula, go. I prefer 8 to 10 millimeters posterior to the limbus, just go underneath. You can see the membranes can be tackled very easily in these cases, you just use a max grip. And after removing, I realize that there is one more napkin ring. Yeah, so we can just grasp it and the whole membrane comes. and. Uh, in fact, uh, it is very easy to uh, go to any quadrant with this one single entry and room. So we can now find this the last the napkin ring. The reason why I don't want to do a retinotomy and remove the napkin ring is many a times the PFCL will uh, keep under this and uh, need to uh, what you call subretinal PFCL and all those things. So once it is done, then we go for the rest of surgery. Uh, in this case, again, it's also subretinal band. But if you find that the fluid is not adequate, what I do is uh, I take a silicon oil injector filled with BSS, mounted on a pot, or I mean 40 gauge cannula, inject the f I mean fluid adjacent to the yeah, adjacent to the bands into the subretinal space. It uh, definitely increases the height of the retina so that when we do, we can go for uh, uh, what you call the band removal, as I have told earlier. And macular fold, which uh, I have come across quite common actually, not in the macula, but uh, elsewhere. This is one of the grave, uh, I mean, uh, uh, complication, especially in GRT when it is slipping. So what I prefer to do is, like you would detach, again mounted on a silicon oil injector, BSS on a 44 gauge needle, just go inside. You re-detach the retina, yeah, in all the four quadrants, and once if you do the fluid exchange, all this, uh, what do you call, subretinal uh, blisters uh, coalesce and they nicely form a single bubble. And over that, you can uh, inject PFCL, and I have the habit of uh, peeling ILM in most of the cases, so I have done in this case also. And then we went in for uh, the, what do you call, endo laser and uh, fluid air exchange and filled with silicon oil. Later, the silicon oil was removed in this case. And this was a pre and post up and uh, believe me the patient is having 6-9 vision but unfortunately is having CNVM in that right. And I think for want of time I will uh, stop with this and uh, can uh, go for a discussion. Thank you Anand. Thanks uh, Naresh. Uh, wonderful videos uh, where the topic was handling complications. <laughs> uh, so anyway wonderful. I think you saw previous speaker's topic and <laughs> got uh, enthusiastic. So anyway wonderful let me just quickly try to uh, the saying Dr. Lingam Gopal. Uh, Managing hemostasis, that's a kind of a young surgeon's uh, pain when they try uh, complicated uh, uh, surgeries like this. So some tips on managing uh, massive hemorrhaging when a young surgeon is uh, handling, uh, you know, be doing these peels. And very often these clot is and form a, uh, a second membrane and it's very sticky, bad big blood. So in this, these kind of cases, what are your uh, take-homes for a young surgeon? No, PVR or PDR? PDR. I think yesterday there was a lot of discussion about, about hemorrhage, but basically you re-emphasize the point, you try to reduce the clot because you're dissecting in one place, another place the clot is keeping on accumulating, so in between try to remove it so you don't allow the clot to become a major force to deal with later on. Keep, keep reducing the clot as we proceed. And usually it tends to stop and doesn't permit us, uh, permits us to complete surgery. If it is uh, Elevated bleed, obviously, you can cauterize it. 
or the breeder from the peripheral retina, you can directly cauterize it. But if it's a breeder right over the optic disc, you can't cauterize it. People have used mechanical pressure, but I would be hesitant to use mechanical pressure on the optic disc and that can still cause nerve damage. There's mechanical pressure on the peripheral retina, major vessels, you obviously don't want to cauterize there, you can use mechanical pressure. And intermittently raising the pressure of the infusion fluid is commonly done. But what we forget is to lower it at the appropriate time because the bleeding is not much and you keep on operating and that definitely can result in a poor visual outcome if you don't intermittently lower. I know that the new machines do warn us that three minutes is over, two minutes is over, but it's good that you're assistant and that's also are cognizant of the fact to raise the pressure. Uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, PFCL, if it goes subretinal, especially when you're focusing on doing membranes, your tips to young surgeons on how to manage subretinal and more pertinently submacular PFCL if it goes uh, subretinally, how, how would you, what are your tips yeah, to young surgeons? So basically, I would say unless you relieve the traction and you're sure about that, I would avoid PFCL and particularly when yeah, you That's a very say, important point. Yeah. Because, and, and particularly if you have a posterior break, your traction is not relieved immediately, you'll answer. I think that's a very important thing in our over and through all of us have emphasized about use of PFCL. When you have a lot of posterior dissection to do and when you're approaching it, do not be very enthusiastic in putting that little small bubble there. Because when you're relieving this, you may not see this, but under those membranes, there may be slit breaks. And uh, when you're relieving it, you may be very enthusiastic that, you know, the retina is getting more bullous and the traction is uh, happening. But there could also be a small break. PFCL goes inside and then you have submacular PFCL. And that's pretty tough situation. So in such a situation, what would you do? Ramandeep, what would you uh, do, Raman? I think um, the PFCL again would come to the rescue. Now we have to put the PFCL at the proper place once migrates to the other place. Then you have to aspirate it out from the break from which it went inside. Yep. We have, yeah, one question from Dr. Diksha Katoj, our last question before we hand over. What is the ideal time for re-surgery in re-RD with PVR under oil, early when it's first noticed or letting membranes mature in four to six weeks or until progression posteriorly is noticed? Dr. Gopal. I don't think there's a finite timeline I can give, but... Basically, if the retina is lifted up and you see membranes, they're mature enough for you to remove them. So obviously, if there's a recurrence, the first one week of post-operative period is definitely not due to recurrent PVR. It's because of unrelieved traction during the first surgery or an open break or some other reason. That needs attention, obviously. But if it is a recurrent PVR at the end of, say, one month or something like that, by that time, already the membranes are reasonably mature. I don't think you need to wait for so-called maturity because there's no end point. There's nothing to tell you that the memories are now ripe enough for you to pluck them. So you have to obviously take a call. Yeah, thank you. With that, it's my pleasure to thank all my uh, speakers who've done a fantastic job presenting these uh, difficult cases and my panel, Dr. Likam Gopal, Dr. Prabhu, Dr. Rajpal, Dr. Mahesh, uh, Dr. Namandeep. Thank you very much, Sarman. Thank you. And over to, and we finished with one minute over. We started eight minutes late. So we made up time for the VRSI scientific program. It's a pleasure to hand over the podium and stage to Vivek Dave for the next session on end off.